Um, all right, so we are uh, we're just finishing up the pentad here, and we're going to talk next about two really important ideas within Kenneth Burke's uh, I, uh, vision of how it is that we should do rhetorical criticism. The first is what he calls this guilt redemption cycle, where Burke says that all rhetoric is founded in guilt. And by guilt, he means something really um, kind of bigger. First of all, we should pause here and say that one thing that Burke did a lot of was he used a lot of religious language. Um, and um, it was just a, really a metaphor that he thought really uh, captured what happens within persuasion quite well. Um, when he says guilt here, what he means is any kind of negative feelings. Um, he says that there's um, fundamentally something wrong with the human condition we need to fix. He used the idea of original sin as a metaphor here, but right? Guilt can be anxiety, embarrassment, disgust, tension, anger, just uh, anything that's really a negative kind of emotion. He says that the guilt is a fundamental, the important part of understanding persuasion. Because he says that a rhetorician needs to try and um, create some kind of guilt for people. Often it's called the rhetorical situation, but not only is a rhetorician there to try to move something from point A to point B, right, to get people to think something, but it's also there to create a kind of problem. The rhetorician needs to identify what he or she thinks is wrong, and then you re swoop in with a redemption, right? You redeem the situation as a rhetorician. Um, and this um, requires a kind of victimage. He says that there has to be someone to blame for our situations. It can be the rhetorician itself, or it could be the audience. But one of the jobs of a rhetorician is to lay blame onto people as well. Um, and um, right, if you think about like a presidential campaign, for example, we get blame passed around all the time, right? Victimage is something that's just uh, um, pervasive in those kind of settings, right? Um, and so. Um, Right, like maybe one thing to think about in your journal is who do you think tends to get portrayed as victims in these type of um, situations? Because some examples would be really helpful. Also, using this religious imagery, he uses God and devil terms, which God and devil terms are terms that do not need to be described. They encompass everything that is either evil or good, and they're used to motivate an audience. Um, now, Burke says a rhetorician should not define these terms. You should not describe what they are. Um, so if we um, um, uh, try to think about like common devil terms that we might hear or something, right? Like terrorist, for example, is a devil term. Well, when you break down like the definition of what terrorist is, it becomes really kind of political in a way that it wasn't before, and you risk alienating some of your audience. Or I think of another devil term, something like welfare state, right? Um, right? A term that doesn't need to be described, and when it's invoked, it invokes kind of a whole idea of like evil that comes along with it. God terms work as well. Things like um, freedom, right? Land of the free, for example, right? A good example of a God term. Um, a term that doesn't need to be described or defined, but kind of encompasses all that's good. So this is an interpretive theory, highly interpretive. So let's run it through. Does it give us a new understanding of people? It sure does. It moves us away from that kind of logos, logic-based um, vision of rhetoric and moves us to something different, the idea of identification. Does it clarify its values? Yeah, Burke is pretty upfront about what it is that he's trying to do here. He's telling us that he wants to give us the ability to try and um, think about persuasion in a new kind of way, and particularly as a rhetorical critic to understand how arguments work. Aesthetic appeal. I think it's very high on aesthetic appeal. This is a theory that's creative and clever, um, and it gives a, it has a sense of identification itself. I think a lot of people identify with this theory. Discussion and community of agreement, like I said in the beginning of the lecture, one of the most popular theorists that are out there, so high on that. Reform of society, because um, it's about understanding how arguments work and not as much about understanding how to make arguments. It might be kind of low on the reform of society, but anyway, four to five isn't that bad. So anyway, stick around. Next time we're going to be doing another rhetorical theory, and I'll see you all next